Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Guys, look. Triple, triple chin. All right, uh, I, I've kept wanting to um, understand what these mysterious God made. Okay, I'm, I'm acting dumb. Um, original link to the video, top of the description. Below that, link to the Discord. We'd love to have you. They're nice. No. Uh, but you could balance it out. Uh, preemptive like, history calling. Giant's Causeway. So I've asked in a few videos that these have appeared in. Um, pictures of them. You know, like the octagon-shaped, or pentagon-shaped, whatever the shape is. Um, of those stone things rising right off, right next to the coast. And I, either, whichever answer it is, whether it's somehow man-made involved or it's natural, I will be... Very impressed and fascinated either way. So, win-win. Double-edged sword or blunted... Ah, let's go. Hi, history lovers, oh, and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. I gotta restart. Hi, history lovers, and Hi. welcome or welcome... Welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling, I have a story for you that involves volcanoes, rival giants, and a race of malevolent deities. And the setting for this video is none other than my own home country of Northern Ireland. I'm speaking, of course, about the history of the Giant's Causeway, a collection of over 40,000 basalt stones which are often hexagonal in shape and which naturally fit together. This is not only our most famous landmark, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the source of one of the most famous Irish legends around, that of the giant Finn McCool, sometimes called Fingal, and his Scottish rival ben So it is a world heritage site, which means it's probably not natural, right? Or it's just... Ben and Donner, also known as the Red Man. So sit back... My God. And his Scottish rival, Ben and Donner, also known as the Red Man. So sit back, relax, and prepare for a breakdown of Irish legend versus reality, as I give you both the scientific explanation for the Causeway's origins, and also the more entertaining tales that those of us who grew up here were taught in primary school. Science is entertaining. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with the notification switched on so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. You can also follow me on Instagram, which is linked in the description box. And if you would like to support me further, you have the option to make a one-off donation using the thanks button below this video, which will enable you to post a customizable and brightly colored comment under it and get a one-time animation over the top of the video. How do I get? Let's start with the scientific explanation of what brought the Giant's Causeway into being. The stones are around 50 to 60 million years old and were formed by volcanic activity in what has been called the tertiary period of Earth's history, though apparently that terminology is a little outdated now. To quote the Smithsonian Magazine, a flood of lava oozed from fissures in the Earth. The molten rock cooled and contracted, cracking into a series of some 40,000 columns, mostly in near-perfect hexagonal shapes. Research has indicated that this cracking occurred between 1,544 and 1,634 degrees Fahrenheit. The causeway therefore had a very violent start to life and has also been... I'm so uh, pleasantly surprised that they just used Fahrenheit. So I hope... She goes into why, like, why the hexagonal, hexagonal shape, like, why that shape? Why, why not, like, a bunch of randomly shaped rocks? It, it just, or, I, the causeway that, or just, like, why didn't it just jut up in a bunch of, like, any other thing? Just, like, as, uh, 
you know. therefore had 1,634 degrees Fahrenheit. The causeway therefore had a very violent start to life and has also been here for far longer than humans, so there would never have been any people in what is now Northern Ireland who could remember the causeway not being there or offer any scientific explanation as to how it came to be, at least not until modern science was invented. Still, from the late 17th century onwards, the historians and proto-archaeologists of the day did their best to explain this strange but beautiful phenomenon. In 1688, Sir Robert Redding... Sorry, so, so they were formed not, like, pretty, like, not long after the dinosaurs, because weren't dinosaurs in, like, 69 million years ago, something like that? Well, I, nine million years, that's, that's a lot. But geologically speaking, I feel like nine million years is pretty short. So I'm not saying they're connected. It's just interesting. A member of full phenomenon. In 1688, Sir Robert Redding, a member of the Royal Society, which looked and still does look into science, wrote a letter to the Society's other members, which was read out at their meeting in January 1689. A summary of this letter, which is the earliest surviving account of the causeway we have, appears in the minutes of the Society's meeting. These recorded that. There was read Sir Robert Redding's description of the giant's causey, and that's not a typo, they referred to it as a causey, within two miles of Dunluce, which is a reference to Dunluce Castle, the ruins of which still exist a couple of miles up the road from the causeway, to the north thereof in the county of Antrim in Ireland where there are a vast quantity of hexagonal pillars of stone about eight inches side, which stand pitched perpendicularly as in a pavement running down obliquely into the sea. These columns are so regularly ranged and fitted one to the other that it seems rather the work of art than... Going down obliquely into the sea. are so regularly ranged and fitted one to the other that it seems rather the work of art than nature, and they are made up of pieces of about eight inches deep, the convexity of the bottom parts entering into a cavity in the top of the next under it made to receive it. And they are made up of pieces of about eight inches deep, the convexity of the bottom parts entering into a cavity in the top of the next under it made to receive it. So they're like teeth growing? Why aren't, then, if that's the case, then why aren't there, like, tons of rocks burying all of this? The rocks that were, you know, fallen off and were replaced. Did I hear that right? Like, well, like if, if they were replaced, then where are all of the replaced pieces? There are a couple of points to note here. First, not all the stones are hexagons, though a great many are. Second, although Redding thought they were too perfectly made and fitted together to be the result of nature, of course we know that that is exactly how they were formed. It was hard for anyone who hadn't seen the causeway to really understand what it looked like though, particularly given how unusual the structure is. It was only in 1694 that the first known image of it, which you can see here, was executed by a man named Christopher Cole. It was drawn from an imaginary perspective, as aerial views like this weren't possible until the invention of hot air balloons and aircraft. And perhaps because of this, and Cole's... Jesus, that was so bright. ...the invention of hot air balloons and aircraft. And perhaps because of this, and Cole's limitations as an artist, it is not strictly accurate, though it isn't terrible either. Two years later, Edwin Sandys was sent by the Dublin Philosophical Society to make a second, more accurate drawing, which was published in 1697, and which you see on screen now. Other drawings would follow in the next century, as the causeway's appearance became familiar to a wider audience. Then, in the mid to late 19th century, photographs began to emerge of it, which put pay to the need for the less reliable medium of hand-drawn images. Unfortunately, as its fame grew, so too did the practice of removing stones from the cause. I had to fix my camera. I need to go back. I didn't hear that. In the mid to late right 19th century, photographs began to emerge of it, which put pay to the need for the less reliable medium of hand-drawn images. Unfortunately, as its fame grew, so too did the practice of removing stones from the causeway, either for scientific analysis elsewhere or just to be used for ornaments. The one you see here sits in the gardens of Hillsborough Castle, which is the monarch's official residence in Northern Ireland. 
Irish writer, philosopher and politician William Molyneux wrote to the Royal Society in London in 1697 that he had two chunks of Causeway stone in his garden in Ireland and would send them one by boat, which he duly did. His brother Thomas had also removed pieces and taken them to his home in the late 1690s. One of the more egregious examples of this practice which I've read about, though, comes from a letter written in 1753 by the Reverend Richard Pocock, who was then the Archdeacon of Dublin and who reported that during the previous summer of 1752, I spent a week at the Causeway and sent away... Did that mean to happen? ...of 1752... I spent a week at the Causeway, and sent away by sea to Dublin as great a variety of stones as I could conveniently get, particularly a large octagon with the eight large stones round it, a pair of less with eight pair that encompass it, two small pentagon pillars about fourteen inches over, one of them three feet ten and a half inches high, the other five feet seven inches, one hexagon pillar about the same size and five feet five inches high, all which I have placed in my garden. So, so basically this tall. guy took enough to make his own mini causeway back home, which I consider shameful vandalism, which permanently damaged the causeway and which showed no consideration for future generations. Those stones had been sitting there quite happily for at least 50 million years until Pocock decided that he was so special that he should... Okay, I, there's, I definitely misheard or misunderstood or wasn't paying enough attention. So I guess they don't. Re oh no, they do replace. All right. So did I misunderstand? And they didn't. They didn't replace themselves once they got a bit high, or is it that I didn't understand and that it just happens over such a long period of time that there's not, you know, it. They still are there for a long time. You know, the the only like one that I I, I thought was kind of okay was the one that was taken for like a and put in like a Nor Northern Ireland like state house or something. I, I, I think that's okay. To be able to just rip them up but, and stick them but in not his garden. Just anyone I'm not doing impressed. it. As studies of the causeway increased, more accurate theories regarding its creation gradually began to appear. And by 1834, though there was still no consensus as to how it had come about, many people were on the right track. As an article in the Dublin Penny Journal for that year said, with respect to the formation of the basalts along the Causeway coast, as well as of basalts in general, various and opposing opinions have been entertained by some of the most scientific men, one party maintaining they were formed by the action of water, and another as strenuously contending that they owe their origin to fire, and are simply the formations of boiling lava which at a remote period had issued from the crater of some volcano now extinct. The mythical stories of the causeway's origins never disappeared though, and so we come to the fun bit of the video, a retelling of these legends. The Irish name for the causeway, which I'll put on screen for you but which I'm not going to attempt to say because I don't speak Irish and I'll just botch it, suggests one lesser known myth behind its formation, because it translates to stepping stones of the Formori. The Formori, or the Formorians, according to the Dictionary of Celtic Mythology, were pre-Christian deities, often depicted as demonic or, at the very least, monstrous. The far more famous explanation given by mythology for the causeway's existence, though, concerns an Irish giant named Finn McCool and his Scottish rival Ben and Donner. There are various versions of this tale, each with slightly different details, so the story I'm going to tell you shouldn't be taken as the definitive account because no such account exists. Yep. But the gist of the story is as follows. Once upon a time, there was an Irish giant named Finn McCool, who was engaged in a war of words with a Scottish giant named Ben and Donner. Bellowing at each other across the water between Scotland and Ireland, each said that he could beat the other in a fight, and so, in order to facilitate that clash, Finn built the causeway, and it will become clear in a minute why I've highlighted the island of Staffa on this map. However, upon making it to Scotland and seeing his would-be foe in the distance, he realised that Ben and Donner was much bigger than he, and so Finn, intelligent man that he was, naturally took off back to Ireland as fast as he could. Unfortunately for him, Ben and Donner was in pursuit. 
Finn made it back to what is now the North Antrim coast, where he lived with his wife, let's call her Una, but I've heard her given various names, and was in such haste to get back into the house that after passing the giant's or Is he saying that, like, the really big, bigger giant guy, like, when he stomped on the ground, all of this rose up or something? Or am I... Organ, which he... And was in such haste to get back into the house that after passing the giant's organ, which he used to make music, here are its pipes, though some people also call them looms, and going through the giant's gate, which leads from the causeway into a little beach-like area next to it, he lost one of his boots on the shoreline, where it still lies today. He arrived back at their home, which was built into the cliffs, though sadly only the chimney stacks remain nowadays, and Una quickly came up with a plan to deal with Ben and Donner. Finn got into their baby's cradle, the baby plan to deal with... So, if someone, like, shot, like broke off or chopped off one of these, people would be really mad, right? Because it's it's like part of the fable, right? Like imagine if you if you like chopped off the chimney part that yeah. I mean it's kinda crazy but only the chimney stacks remain nowadays, and Una quickly came up with a plan to deal with Ben and Donner. Finn got into their baby's cradle. The baby either wasn't there, or in some versions of the story, Finn had time to build a crib. And when Ben and Donna arrived, spoiling for a fight, Una told him that Finn wasn't at home, but that he was welcome to wait. Whilst in her house, she gave him bread with an iron plate baked inside it, telling him when he complained about the difficulty of eating it, that that was her husband's favourite food. Ben and Donner was already worried about what kind of man, or rather giant, Finn would turn out to be, when Una showed him the baby, in inverted commas, in the cradle. Upon seeing the size of the supposed infant, Ben and Donner grew very afraid of how big the father must be, and so he ran back to Scotland, tearing up the causeway as he went so that Finn couldn't follow him. This is why, in Fingal's cave, named after Finn of course, which is on the island of Stan- Whoa, 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 whoa. So through tectonic or volcanic reasons or some other geological force, these things were pushed up and like pillars rising from the ground also lifted all of the stone and rock and ground and dirt with it. That's crazy, if I'm right. Staffa in Scot this is why in Fingal's Cave, named after Finn of course, which is on the island of Staffa in Scotland, Pillars identical to those found at the Giant's Causeway exist, because Staffa was where the Scottish end of the causeway reached land. In reality, of course, the stones on Staffa were created by the same volcanic activity which formed the Giant's Causeway, but How let's dare not you? the story with pesky science. As well as the causeway itself, and the other evidence of Finn's life there, which I've already mentioned, there is also a well which provided the Giant and his family with fresh pesky science. As well as the causeway itself, and the other evidence of Finn's life there, which I've already mentioned, there is also a well, which provided the giant and his family with fresh drinking water, and which is now considered a wishing well. There is a wishing chair, too. I know it's a myth, but like, how, how does... Why would you even create a myth around a whale giving fresh water? They, they live in the sea, in the ocean. How, they're the, they're the last animal that's going to have access to fresh... Okay. Formed from a considered a wishing well. I have to pee. Should I be right? I can There's a wishing chair, too, formed from a set of stones which make a throne. In days gone by, the chair was only supposed to be sat on by women, and so was known as the ladies' wishing chair. But nowadays, all Sexist. are welcome to give it a go, and the number of bottoms which have sat on it have apparently made the stone there extra smooth. You might also hear some additional bits of the two giants' story, Isle of Man. including that Finn scooped up- I'm gonna watch a Isle of Man um, TT race motorcycle, or maybe sidecar, or both, after this. You'll hear some additional bits of the two giants' story, including that Finn scooped up a huge mound of earth and threw it across the channel at Ben and Donner at some point during their disagreement, only to miss quite spectacularly and inadvertently create the Isle of Man, which lies in the Irish Sea between Britain and Ireland. The gap left where he removed the earth from Ireland filled with water and became Loch Ness, 
not to be confused with Scotland's Loch Ness, and no, we don't have a Loch Ness monster, if anyone's wondering, though we really should invent one because tourists love it. Yeah, you do. I've seen them. Thing. Yeah, tourists And track. so, history lovers, now... You... <gasps> There's the giant's ki uh, uh, chidney. I was about to say kidney. Chidney. Jesus! Chimney. You know the tourists love that kind of thing. And so, history lovers, now you know the story, or rather stories, of the Giant's Causeway. I'll leave it up to you which version of events you opt to believe in. Uh, the Giants. No, but my, like, my alternate, I gotta pee so bad, but my alternate theory, like, I, one theory she didn't, or one thing, so she went, you know, the geological reason, which clearly is the scientifically backed, and what I, makes more, most sense to me, but the only other thing is that like some ancient civilization in northern ireland like just carved like it was a rocky place and they just kind of carved it in for some reason just made it all kind of hexagons um i gotta be so bad love you all see you guys next time hope you're doing well if not chin up you you'll be okay don't worry emotions are fickle guys see you guys next time bye i gotta be